I want to continue um, talking about the vision that we have for our church as we're heading into the fall season and, and as the church grows and new people come. So where do we go and how do we get there is what we've entitled the message. And, and there was a saying by a church in England in the 1700s that really got my attention. And it simply is a vision without a task is a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery, and a vision and a task is the hope of the world. What I'm trying to communicate to you is really the vision that we have for our church. And then I want to give you, in a practical sense, a task to help fill out the vision. And we've looked at two parts of what our vision is so far. The first part of our vision is to love people with the love that Jesus had for them. You know, if you see what Jesus did, you could see the compassion that he had for people. And not people who had their life all together, but people who didn't have their life all together. Jesus wanted to come alongside them and point them to where real life could be found. And that's the goal and the vision for our church. In Matthew 9, 13, Jesus said, I've come to invite the outcasts of society and sinners, not those who think they are already on the right path. That is the heart of our church. Jesus wants to bring life to people and he wants to set them free from harmful behavior. He wants to set them free from depression. He wants to give them life and life abundantly, Scripture says. And that's the heart of our church as well, to come alongside people and to point people to Jesus. We want our church to be a church that loves people with the same love and compassion that Jesus had and to accept people where they are at so they feel comfortable coming here. The second part of our vision is for us to carry out the first part by being empowered with the Holy Spirit. We are to be empowered to take the message that Jesus himself had given and we're to be empowered and to share that message ourselves. You know, for all of us to receive the same power that Jesus promised his disciples in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. And that's... The goal of our church is for people to be empowered to go out and to share the good news of what Jesus had told the people, that there is hope, that there is life. And I want to continue in this vein this morning. You know, last week or two weeks ago, we looked at how God had poured out his Holy Spirit. Peter um, had preached to 3,000 people or Peter had preached to a whole bunch of people and 3,000 people responded in one setting and became followers of Jesus. And then a little bit later, Peter and John are walking to the temple and they heal a man who is lame from birth. Didn't have a sore toe that he stubbed, but this guy had been lame from birth and Peter and John, they pray for him. They don't pray for him. They speak to him. They speak to him, you know. Don't get off track, Chuck. They spoke to him and they said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the guy rose and he's jumping and leaping and praising the Lord. And then you know what happens? Peter preaches another message. Peter preaches another message and I think he thinks that there's going to be another 3,000 or maybe there's going to be 5,000 people that are saved and come. And you know what happens? It's not 3,000 people that are added and it's not 5,000 people. What happens? Because Peter and John were used to heal a man. They run into trouble and they start to be persecuted by the church leaders. 
And I bet that caught Peter and John off guard and the disciples off guard. They think they had this figured out. But you know what? It landed them in trouble. So what do they do? Do they go and do they hide and do they try to change the message so that it's acceptable to the people? Do they try to just go around and hint that Jesus is the Christ and that there's life? No. You know what they do? They pray. And I want you to see the boldness in their prayer in Acts 4.29. And it says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats. The threats that they'd received. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. All boldness. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You know what the Greek word for boldness is? The Greek word for boldness is parisia. And it basically is talking about unrestrained boldness. Unrestrained boldness. Peter and John and the disciples pray and they continue to speak the word of God with parisia, with unrestrained boldness. The person who speaks with parisia speaks with absolute confidence. And while the word parisia quite often is used in how we speak to just be very forceful and blunt and speak the truth in love, but to speak the truth and to be very bold, it is more than just speaking. It's an attitude. Peter and John and the disciples prayed for an attitude of parisia, for an attitude of boldness, for an attitude of absolute boldness, that they would just continue to push through. They had a different attitude. They wanted to fulfill the destiny that God had for them. And I think that's the attitude that should rise up in us as well. And to rise up in this congregation to have parisia, to speak the word with absolute boldness, with absolute confidence. That's the third part of the vision for this church is for this church, for the members of this church to have unrestrained boldness. Not unrestrained ignorance, but unrestrained boldness so that, they can, so that we can go and we can accomplish those things that God would have us accomplish. Unrestrained boldness. You know, the word parisia is used numerous times in Scripture. Let me give you another verse that has this same word. In Hebrews 10.35 it says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your parisia, which has a great reward. This boldness or this confidence that the disciples prayed for brings a great reward. It brings a great reward and we can go forward with parisia. Confidence is parisia. You know, I think so often we think, God, if you move, if you do something, God, if you, if you act, then we will act. And I think we get it wrong because I think God wants us to act. God wants us to have parisia. God wants us to step forward and to do some things. And then if we're willing to do that, then we will see God act. We need to have this Parisia, we need to have this utter confidence because it has a great reward. Do you know another place this verse, or this verse, this word is used? It's in Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us then with confidence, let us then with Parisia, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
Let us draw near with Parisia. Let us draw near with this utter confidence to the throne of grace in our time of need. And I've said this numerous times before, but it's not when everything is going right in our life. It's not when you've been sin-free for 320 days. It's not when you're on top of the world and have utter confidence that you can go to the throne of God. But you can go to the throne of God in your time of need. And we need to go with Parisia. We need to go with utter confidence to find grace in our time of need. To find grace in our time of need. The most common definition for the, word of, for the word grace is God's unmerited favor. That seems to be the definition that um, churches accept most of the time. But I like the definition that grace is God's enabling power. God's enabling power. So let me just paraphrase a little bit here. Let us draw near to God with extreme boldness so that we may receive God's enabling power. In John 16 verse 24 he says, Until now you've not been bold enough to ask the Father for a single thing in my name, but now you can ask and Keep on asking and you can be sure that you will receive what you ask for and your joy will have no limits. We can ask and the word for ask is to ask with urgency even to the point of demanding. I'm talking about a whole different attitude that we can have when it comes to prayer and when it comes to us being bold and when it comes to us pushing forward. Let me share something with you that I know is really going to shock you this morning. Are you ready? God is not a polite Canadian. God is not a polite Canadian. And I love politeness and I love Canadians. And I'm so thankful for our culture. But God doesn't subscribe to our culture when it comes to this sort of thing. You see, I think we're far too timid. And I think we're far too complacent. And I think we're far too willing to accept circumstances the way we are. We need to get some Parisia. We need to, to, to ask and to keep on asking, to not give up and to push through. We need to, we need to go to the throne room of grace with utter confidence. And say, God, you've promised this in your word. You've said that this is, is, you've said this in your word. You said that you would give us life. And not let go until we receive life. I think we're far too timid of a people. I think I'm far too timid myself. Of course, we need to go forward with Parisia. But I'm not talking about demanding selfish things for ourselves. You know, James said, you don't have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask that you can spend the results of your prayers on selfish things. So I'm not talking about selfish things here. Oh God. I don't know, nothing comes to mind. Make Joyce listen to me. <laughs> it's not selfish things that I'm talking about. But you know, it's things to expand the kingdom of God. It's things to, to push forward. You know, I was reading, and this is next week's sermon, so... Come this week and you don't have to come next week, I guess. But I'm going to talk about boldness for the next little while. And you know, I think we think that we say something or we hint at something to people. You know, with the Apostle Paul in Acts 18, do you know what he did? He argued with people. 
And he talked to people. And he presented the gospel to people. I think it's time for us to have a little Parisia. I think it's time for us to have a little Parisia and to push forward. You know, like I said, Jesus wasn't raised in our Canadian culture. And if we're going to understand the words that Jesus said, it's going to help us if we understand the culture in which he said the words, right? Does that make sense? So, I've been reading a book by Lois Tuverberg, Tuverberg, something like that. You don't know how to say her name either, so get over it. But in this book, she's talking about the culture and how Jesus' words would have been understood in the Jewish culture. And one chapter in this book is entitled Praying with Chutzpah. Chutzpah is utter nerve, sheer audacity that borders on obnoxiousness. Do you know that Jesus likes it when we pray with chutzpah? Jesus likes it when we pray with chutzpah. Let me give you some examples to show you. I'll take you to a few places in Scripture. Jesus likes it when we pray this way. You know, Jesus and his disciples were entire, and I don't know, they might have been in a house. This is what the book says, so bear with me. If um, the theology's wrong, it's Lois's problem, it's not mine, right? But, how's that for having, ah, shut up Chuck, let's move on. So probably Jesus is in the house with his disciples, they're, they've, they're trying to get away from the crowds just to have an evening of peace. And then a Canaanite woman comes And she begins to bang on the door and she begins to shout for Jesus to heal her daughter. Her daughter is demon-possessed. And you know how Jesus responds? He ignores her. He ignores her. And there she is banging on the door and Jesus is ignoring her and finally his disciples beg Jesus to send her away. And you know what Jesus' response is? I was only sent to minister to the Jewish people. This is Jesus that this woman is dealing with. How many of you, if Jesus would have responded to you, like if Jesus would have responded like that to you, you would have been gone? Probably aggravated. And gone. Do you know what Jesus says to her? Let's pick up the story in verse Matthew 15, verse 25. It says, and then she came, when Jesus responds to her, that he sent to minister just to the Jewish people, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But Jesus answered, it's not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was instantly healed. The chutzpah, the chutzpah of this woman, not letting go, not letting go, and Her daughter ends up healed. And Jesus, I want you to see this. Jesus rewarded the chutzpah of this woman who didn't let go but kept pushing in and kept pushing in and kept pushing in and kept pushing in and kept kept knocking on the door. And even when the disciples are saying, get lost, and even when Jesus is rebuking her, she keeps pushing in and Jesus rewarded her chutzpah. You know what? Jesus likes chutzpah. He likes utter nerve and sheer audacity. He likes extreme boldness and confidence. 
Jesus is not a polite Canadian. Let me take you to another story in Scripture. Jesus is preaching about prayer and he's talking to his disciples about how they should pray. How they should pray. How they should pray. And he says in Luke 18, he said, In a city there was a judge who did not fear God or regard man. So this is not a holy, righteous judge. This is a a judge who is not a good man. And then in verse 3, there's a woman in the city and she came to him saying, avenge me against my adversary. She wants to have justice done. And the judge, because he's not a righteous judge, he ignores her. In verse 4, he would not for a while, yet afterwards he said to himself, though I do not fear God or respect man, yet because this this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest... By her continually coming, she will weary me. Jesus is using this as an illustration of how we are supposed to pray. This is how we are supposed to pray. You know, I've heard people say, you know, ask God once and then thank Him for the answer. That's not what this is saying. That's not what I see that this is saying. Jesus is saying, have a little chutzpah in your prayer and just because you don't see your prayer answered right away, don't quit, but keep Pushing and keep pounding. And then look what he says in the next verse. In verse 7 he says, And shall not God avenge his own elect and be patient with them who cry day and night to him? You see, this is the attitude that we are supposed to have when it comes to this sort of thing. You know, there's a story in Jewish history, it's not part of the Bible, but there's a story in Jewish history about a a man who lived about a hundred years before Jesus came. And his name was Honi, and he was known for his great prayers that God would answer. And there was a drought in a land. And these people come to Honi and they beg, would you pray that this drought would be ended? And do you know what Honey does? He draws a circle in the ground and he steps into the circle and he says, God, I'm not stepping out of this circle until it rains. I dare you. God, I'm not stepping out of this circle until we have some summer in this country. (laughs) I don't recommend that. That's not the moral of the story. So Honey's standing in the circle, and he says, God, I'm not going to step out of this circle until it rains. And it starts to sprinkle. And Honey says, no, God, that's not what I meant. I want a rain that fills, what we need is a rain that fills cisterns and fills caverns. And then it starts to pour. Buckets and sheets of water come down and Honey says, no God, that's not what I mean either. I mean a gentle rain that nourishes the ground and doesn't wash away the soil. And it rains the way he prays. not part of scripture but it sure makes a point you know I think we need some of this attitude when it comes to us praying and asking God think of Abraham's chutzpah 
You know, I think, I, think we read, I think we read some of these stories and we don't understand the setting and we think these stories are set in our culture. They're not. They're not. And in the book I read, he gives an example of he gives an example of a woman who got on a city bus. This is the way the Jewish culture is. I've never been to Jerusalem, but this is the way the Jewish culture is. There was a woman who pushed her way on the bus and wouldn't pay the toll. And so her and the driver go back and forth a little bit. And the driver finally, after arguing with her to no result, throws up his hands and sits there on a busy street in Jerusalem and reads a newspaper while traffic is backing up behind him. And he sits there and he reads the newspaper as traffic backs up behind him until the woman gets off the bus and then he continues. That's the culture in which these stories are written, people. And we need to get a little of that. I think we absolutely need to get a little of that. We want, we think that we're supposed to be nice and polite and we, and we need to be. But when it means that we run away too soon, Look at Abraham's chutzpah. You know, God visits Abraham and he tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what Abraham does? This is God. This is God. Do you know what Abraham does? He bargains with God. And he says, God, what if there's 50 people. What if there's 50 righteous people in this city? Will you destroy these cities? Do you know what God does? He says, no, I won't destroy the city. And then the number goes down to, I think it's 45, and then 30, and then 20, and then 10. This is Abraham. He's bargaining with God. You know, Moses... God tells Moses when Moses is leading the children of Israel out of the promised land, God tells Moses, this is God. And God tells Moses, stand aside and I'm going to destroy these people and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And do you know what Moses does? Moses gets down and he asks God, no, don't destroy this people. God, or or." Abraham and Moses are bargaining with God. I really believe that we need to have a bit of this kind of an attitude ourselves. We need to have this extreme boldness. We need to have some chutzpah. And this requires extreme faith. But you know what else it requires? It requires extreme trust and confidence in God. And what you absolutely need to be convinced of is His love for you and the power and desire that He has to take care of us. For you to have the chutzpah For you to have the parisia that I'm talking about, you have to be absolutely convinced of God's love for you. I think we quit too easy. You know, God, God, intervene. God, my son or my daughter or my loved one, God, you have to intervene. And God, I'm not going to let go until this person is following you. I'm not going to let go until I see a miracle happen. We need to have a little chutzpah. We need to not just pray for five seconds every third week. My vision for this church is for it to rise up 
and to be the major force that it should be. And let me close with one more illustration. In Acts 14, the setting is Paul and Barnabas. Well, I'll just read you the story. Acts 14, starting in verse 8, it says, In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas encountered a man who from birth had never walked. Not a stubbed toe. He'd never walked. And he's listening to Paul preach. Imagine Paul standing up here this morning and he's preaching. That's the setting in which this was written, okay? And there's a guy who's in the congregation and he's in a wheelchair and he's been lame from birth. He's listening carefully to Paul as he preached. All of a sudden, Paul discerned that this man had faith in his heart to be healed. You know what Paul's response is? You! Stand to your feet! I'm not making this stuff up, people. You know, there's more healings in Scripture. There's a lot more healings where people were commanded to be healed than there was nice, quiet prayer for them to be healed. He shouted, you, he shouted, he shouted, he shouted. Other versions put, he said loudly, he shouted, you, in the name of our Lord Jesus, stand on your feet. And the man instantly jumped up to his feet and stood for the first time in his life and he walked. Talk about extreme boldness. Crippled from birth. And this guy is healed. You know, how many of you, don't humor me, but how many of you, when I preach like this, there's something in you that rises up and says, yes, this is what I need. I think that's the Holy Spirit. And He, wanna take, he wants to take us to a whole other Place. He wants to take us to a whole other level. And how many of you in closing here? And this takes chutzpah on my part. But how many of you, if I was to say, in Jesus' name, be healed. Stand to your feet and be healed. How many of you would jump to your feet? In Jesus' name, be healed. Stand and rise. Enough. Enough. Enough of putting up with things. It's time for us to have extreme boldness. It's time for us to have paresia. It's time for us to understand that God has empowered us. You know, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you can speak in tongues. And you can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but if you don't have paresia, you're not going to accomplish very much in life. It is time for us to add the missing ingredient to this congregation. And the missing ingredient, I think, is paresia. The missing ingredient is for us to have absolute boldness to take the gospel message.
outside of these four walls, to love people with the love that Jesus had for people, to come alongside people and to encourage them and to become empowered in the Holy Spirit and then to act like we are empowered. Be healed. Be healed. Crippled from birth. God honors this type of attitude. And God honors this type of prayer. Father, you are so good. You are so good. And we love you so much. And Father, I just ask that you would forgive each one of us for our timidity, that you would forgive us for not pushing through, but Father, that we would push through until we can see the results of what we know and what we believe that you're calling us to. You know, I'm speaking to myself here this morning. But I believe I'm also speaking to some other people. You know that you have a call on your life. You know that God is calling you to make a difference in this world. And maybe it's standing up in this platform and preaching, but that's not what I'm talking about. You know that God has called you. Don't. Quit. Get some paresia and move forward with the power that God has given you. And you know what? Maybe start small. Maybe do some things that you've never done before.